you. First, I'll share a few pictures. It's been a while since I've given you pictures from the Holy Land. It's a year ago now that we were there. And after that, I'll share a few thoughts with you about the Beatitudes. And in a rare moment, I received a phone call this week asking me to repeat a story that I once told uh, about the saints. So now I'm taking requests, you know. And uh, I'd like to share that story to honor that request. But um, we did hear about the Beatitudes, Beatitudes, the Sermon on the Mount, and so some pictures. There is the church, which is on top of the uh, Mount of the Beatitudes. And there's uh, two views of it. I think that's the cue that we're going to go to the next view. There's the other view of the church. And so... Um, up on top of the mountain, beautiful view, not only the church, but from the church, then you see all of the Sea of Galilee. I think we're going to have a picture of the inside of the church next. There we go. That's, that's a very small inside, actually. It's not as large as you would think. Beautiful place to pray. And then from the top of the mountain of the Beatitudes, of course, you see all of the Sea of Galilee. And a couple of views. There's one and then another. Uh, of the, the Sea of Galilee and all of the areas we hear about. And of course, within the church uh, of the Mount of the Beatitudes, there's a beautiful painting of uh, Jesus giving the Sermon on the Mount. And so we'll uh, let it rest on that painting as we reflect upon that and the very beginning of the Sermon on the Mount. Sermon on the Mount is really part of... Um, uh, three chapters uh, uh, together. And the Beatitudes is the very beginning of that. Uh, but when we look at chapters 5, 6, and 7 uh, of Matthew's Gospel, it's the entirety of the Sermon on the Mount. And um, if you look at those three chapters together, not only the Beatitudes, the very beginning, what we heard today, but if you look at all of it together, there's really five very simple points for us to consider, and they are very basic points. First, the uh, Sermon on the Mount provides the attitude, very important to remember that word, the attitude that a person, a child of God, as the second reading reminds us, must have in order to enter the kingdom of heaven. So the first is uh, the attitude by which we want to enter the kingdom. We hear of it in the Beatitudes, but later in the Sermon on the Mount, we're reminded to be salt for the earth. We're reminded to be light for the nations. That's the attitude. Secondly, the Sermon on the Mount provides an intention. Intention. The upright intention for our religious practice. Not to just have a shallow, empty practice, but the intention behind that practice. Third, we're reminded in the Sermon on the Mount to trust in God's providence. The Beatitudes, of course, rely upon our trusting in God, but all of the three chapters remind the child of God, the disciple of Christ, to trust in God's providence. Fourth, the Sermon on the Mount gives us a framework as to how we are to enter into human relationship. So it's not just a relationship with God, but it's human relationship as well. So we're given that framework in the Beatitudes, of course, in particular, but through the whole Sermon on the Mount, how we enter into our human relationships with one another. And then finally, the Sermon on the Mount gives us the conditions. The beginning was the attitude the conditions to enter the kingdom of heaven. We enter, we're told, through the narrow gate. We're told at the end of the Beatitudes that if we are that child of God, that disciple, we better be willing to endure persecution and suffering that comes with that discipleship, that sonship. So the Beatitudes really form, if you will, a a little gateway, the entry, the beginning to the Sermon on the Mount, and uh, the Beatitudes do not, do not provide salvation only for particular kinds of people. You know, sometimes people will say, well, 
you know, uh, as long as I get one of these down pat, I'm in. You know, it's not to be particular kinds of people, but rather it's the invitation for the disciple, that child of God, to conduct themselves by all of them. It gives us that framework of the religious and the moral disposition that Jesus teaches throughout his life. That leads us to salvation. So it's not just to attain one and say, one is good enough and I get in. It's we strive for them all. And I believe if we really do strive to master one or two of them, the others by nature follow. Because the heart, the mind, the soul is transformed to that greater disposition of Jesus' call of salvation. So, these qualities are qualities for us to strive to have. The poverty of spirit to realize God is always above us. Meekness to mourn our own sins and the sins of the world to mourn. To really hunger and thirst make the very uh, drive of our life righteousness. To practice mercy. To be pure of heart and a peacemaker and bringing it all together to be willing to endure that persecution and suffering in the name of the Lord, the willingness for that. The Beatitudes really form a new approach and a focus, and that new approach and focus is salvation in the next world and not material, physical things of this world. Very often in my own life I pray that I take at least a fraction, ideally double the amount, but at least a fraction of the energy I'm concerned about things of this world in my preparation for the kingdom yet to come. And that's what Jesus is really reminding us, to not worry about the physical nature of human life in the world, but rather apply all of that energy, all of that strength, to focusing on the kingdom yet to come. The Beatitudes are not <clears throat> the totality of the gospel, but rather they're the embryo, the very beginning framework of a Christian way of life, to be that child of God. A few thoughts about the Beatitudes to particularly reflect on and maybe in the coming week to, to really look at each of them and, and pray in your own daily prayer to pray for those graces to be alive and real in your life. Part 3, my request of the week. A couple of years ago, I know, I believe it was on All Saints Day, I shared a story uh, told to me by one of my colleagues, Father Len, a number of years ago from 2000 and uh, sorry, from 1999 to 2006, I was vocation director for the Diocese of Buffalo. But for, for two years, I, I served as the vice president of the National Conference of Vocation Directors. I had that position from 2005 until 2007. And uh, Father Len was the president of the board. I was the vice president of the board, so I prayed for him to remain in good health so I didn't have to do his job and mine. That's the job of the vice president, you know, always. And uh, he shared with me this story, shared with all of us. He grew up in Florida. He lives in Tampa. And um, he grew up in a parish run by the Salesian priests. The Salesians, we don't really have any of them here in Buffalo, but the Salesian order, an Italian order of priests, they... Um, Serve not only in parishes, but especially in youth ministry. And it was an order founded by St. John Bosco. St. John Bosco died in 1888. And uh, St. John Bosco, founder of the Salesians, they call themselves Salesians, but often a Salesian priest will refer to himself as being a son of John Bosco. It's another way they call themselves, a son of John Bosco. Father... Len shared the story that when he was growing up as a boy in his parish in Tampa, his pastor, a Salesian priest, shared the story with the parish. One day, 
true story. One day, uh, Father was at the rectory, phone rang for to come to the hospital. That's happened twice already to us today here at St. Greg's. And uh, so, Father went to the hospital. And uh, he wrote down the name of the room number. Walked into the room, they're knocking on the door, and identified who he was, his name, and the woman in the bed called out in an angry tone to get out of the room. Said, I do not want a Catholic priest coming to see me. And the pastor was very perplexed by this entire thing because he, he was just called to come to this room. So he went to the nurse's station. He realized he had the wrong room. So he went to the correct room, and he anointed the person. <clears throat> but it very much troubled him the anger that this woman had. And he noticed her dialect, her Italian dialect, was from the same region of Italy that he himself came from. He was an immigrant from Italy. And so he went back to the room, and as he knocked on the door and, and uh, walked in, he started to speak to her in their dialect. And after a few moments, he, wel he was welcomed in by this woman who once threw him out. And they sat and they were talking. And eventually, the woman asked him, what kind of a priest are you? And rather than saying, I'm pastor of this parish, rather than saying, I'm a Salesian, he used the term that they often use, son of John Bosco. He said, well, I'm a son of John Bosco. And with that, the woman began to cry bitterly, almost uncontrollably, as the story was told to me. And after she composed herself, she said to the priest, you know, I met John Bosco when we were leaving Italy. We were on the docks. I was a little girl. And he came up and he spoke to me. And she said, I have never forgotten what he said to me. She said that John Bosco said to her, little girl, you are about to get on this boat and you are going to go to America. And once you get there, you are going to lose your faith. But I do not want you to worry, because before you die, I am going to send one of my sons who will reconcile you and bring you back to the church. And so that afternoon, that woman went to confession. She received communion, and that very night she died. The power of the saints is real, and that is a true story. And the intercession of the saints on our behalf is real. But what is probably truly needed is our faith in believing it and the lens of faith in order to see it. We think about our connection to the saints as we strive to be that child of God ourselves in the Beatitudes.